It's been nearly 200 days since Elizabeth Holmes was convicted on four counts of criminal fraud, and a couple weeks since her former boyfriend and COO Sonny Balwani was also found guilty, in his case on 12 counts. As they await sentencing later this fall, we're back with something a little different. A conversation with two brilliant talents who are crucial to creating the Hulu limited series, The Dropout, based on this podcast, now nominated for six Emmys. Amanda Seyfried, who's nominated for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie for her portrayal of Elizabeth Holmes. If it doesn't scare me, there's really no point. I think because I choose the things that will be complicated, I, I get very, very afraid that I'm not going to be able to do it at all. And the show's creator and showrunner, Liz Merriweather, nominated for Outstanding Writing for a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie. There's this, like, mix of fear and excitement and just, like, a thing that's gnawing at you where you're like, I can't get this out of my head. What drew these women to Elizabeth Holmes? What scared them the most when they set out to tell this story? And what was the toughest part of getting it right? From ABC Audio, this is The Dropout. I'm Rebecca Jarvis. Bonus episode, Amanda and the Other Liz. Amanda, congratulations on your nomination for Outstanding Lead Actress and welcome. Thanks. Couldn't have done it without you guys. That's for sure. (laughs) It's truly incredible. You're a remarkable performer. And Liz, for your outstanding writing for the episode, I'm in a hurry your nomination. Congratulations. You are pivotal to all of this. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I love this podcast so much. (laughs) I feel like I've entered into my own research. (laughs) (laughs) Liz, where are you right now? I'm in Vermont. And Amanda? I am in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn. And I'm coming to you from my... um, uh, from from my closet in New York City. So very much like every other episode. Um, but I'm so happy we're having this conversation. I've been wanting to have this conversation with both of you for a while. Um, and I think we should start at the beginning. Amanda, I think for you, what has just blown me away is that you really embodied the essence of this character who is still alive. Was it scary to take on a role of somebody who's still around? Yeah, I mean, I think at first, I, I I worry too much about what other people feel in general. This was a really good exercise in trying to work through that because my job at this point was to embody this person that exists, um, this hybrid between the person who exists and the person that Liz wrote. And and if every time I reminded myself that it was a it was it was our version it was her version our version something we're building together i could separate from um caring too much about what the real elizabeth holmes thought because because we're making a tv show and and at the end of the day it's um it's for the audience and her story is very it's very public and has been well researched thanks to you guys. And, and, you know, um, a lot of people are very well aware of her. She's iconic in a lot of ways for a lot of people. And I just had to stay on that track so I wouldn't get sidetracked and into worrying too much about the cost of it for her because, you know, she made her own bed in that way. Um, you know, I don't want to damage anything for her any further than she already has herself. And I also thought because because we're telling the story from a more inside point of view, like we're trying to understand her more, I thought it could really kind of only help. (laughs) Let's talk about, Liz, what drew you to this story. Um, What intimidated you about it? What did you love about it? I I was very intimidated by it. Um, I felt... I mean, first of all, I only written comedy um, and I, you know, worked on a network sitcom, which is very different than 
you know, what a Hulu dramatic limited series is. <laughs> um, so I, I, I was very intimidated for, for that reason. And then also just there had been so much reporting on the story. You know, I, I felt like um, she was she had been kind of dissected by a lot of different people. And I felt like I wasn't sure if the story kind of needed to be told again, which was like a big question that I had in my mind. And then I listened to the podcast and I felt like you guys had gotten her mind in a way that other reporting sort of hadn't yet. And I, I, that that just kind of drew me in because I felt like that was a part of the story that hadn't been told yet. Um, and that was a that was a part of the story that specifically a fictional telling of it could could explore, you know, because I because it, it wouldn't have to, you know, be reliant on rigorous journalism. It could be kind of explored from an emotional place, which is what I felt like I could do. <laughs> that was the one thing I knew I could do. <laughs> so I, um, yeah. And then beyond that, it's like the business side of things, the chemistry, the engineering, the Sunny Elizabeth relationship, which kind of, which had almost no information about it. Um, all of those things, you know, felt very intimidating to me because I, I sort of didn't know where to start with them, but I was so intrigued. Were there any real life people who you've actually come to know, Amanda, that you base the character on? There um, are some people I thought about when I was preparing. You know, me, I, I was able to relate a lot to certain ways I behaved when I was younger, certain things that I find embarrassing. Um, I, I was able to tap into in order to play like the younger version of her. But I think, you know, there are some people in my life from my past that remind me of her um, in terms of how they relate to the world and how uncomfortable they are in their skin. And uh, Liz. Oh, were you saying that I did? I do? Nope, not at all. Do you have any? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Um, did you like who, like just someone that in your life? No, I mean I think I think that you you definitely hit on it with um, that sort of tapping into a younger version of yourself that was uncomfortable in your skin. I mean, I think I did the same thing, and a lot of what I kind of brought to the scripts were my experiences as a younger person running new girl in a position of power in my twenties, like not having a ton of experience. And so I did really draw from those experiences in my own life because I, I related in certain ways to the story. And it's a strange answer to say that you, like you drew from your own life, but I think the work that, that we do, Amanda, I feel like you always kind of have to. And I think if you're not, if you, if you don't connect in that way to something you're working on, then it's probably not what you should be working on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I think I don't, I definitely don't do my best work until I've sort of found my own emotional connection into something. Totally, totally. Is there a process that you guys go through every time you approach new work that gets you there? My process is always to like hate on myself as much as possible until I'm just like, <laughs> like with open nerves and then, and then start from scratch and then like build upon that. Because the truth is I don't go anywhere without my insecurities. That's my reset button. Like I, I've been terrified playing this new role because I haven't worked since the dropout and I felt so present and like safe in that in that world we created by the end I was just not ready to let it go maybe I'm still not and it just took me so long to feel comfortable in this other character that I'm playing that's so much more me than than Elizabeth was so it's just start from scratch hate yourself <laughs> crawl your way uh, out of I, I want I kind of want to understand what that looks like 
Uh, <laughs> like you write in a diary or you just think about all the things you don't like? <laughs> Dear diary, I <laughs> No. <laughs> Today is the day I hate myself the most again. No, I I think it looks like questioning what I'm doing with every single person I know, every actor I know, every person in my immediate family, you know, telling telling everybody, my therapist, my husband, my best friend Jennifer, who's like the best actor I know you know, I don't feel comfortable with this. What am I doing wrong? What can I do? What are the tools? Where do I go? Can you read this script for me? It's basically about getting all the help outside from people I trust, not to validate me or tell me that I'll do a good job, but give me ideas, Mm -hmm. make me ask the right questions, much like a, like a, I think like an acting coach would do. I ask myself the questions and then I get different ideas from different people. And then, and of course the writer and the, and the director always help when we're on set or pre-production, but it's just like, I think I just need to bounce ideas off of every single person before I enter into the, the filming zone. I wonder, Amanda, are you, do you look for, do you, that sort of hate yourself thing that you said jokingly. I mean, I, I I wonder if it's, if it's fear. And I also wonder if it's like, do you look for things that, that scare you? You know, I mean, I I feel like I I feel Mm -hmm. the same way or like in hearing what you are saying. Yeah. I think there's no point if it doesn't scare me, there's really no point unless I'm doing a favor for somebody or I'm get to work a couple days with a best friend or, you know, if I'm going to dive into a project that's going to take me away from my family it has to be important. It has to be something that's going to challenge me and it has to, has to twist my world up in that realm. And so if it doesn't, there's no point. And there, I think because I choose the things that will be complicated, I, I get very, very afraid that I'm not going to be able to do it at all. Hey everyone, it's George. We've got big news from GMA. It's Michael. It's Robin. You can now listen to Good Morning America from the comfort of your home or car or while you walk the dog. We go where you go. Because GMA is now available as a podcast. Get the day's news, our exclusive interviews, and the latest business and health headlines. GMA, the podcast, available for free wherever you listen. Liz, what's your preference? Would you rather write the the stuff that is very limited in its scope in terms of what's already reportable? Or would you rather target the things that have huge amounts of reporting behind them? That's such a good question. I, th- I mean, writing scenes from, you know, using actual words that people s- have been quoted saying was a totally new experience for me, obviously, because, you know, there's no new girl uh <laughs> real story <laughs> that I was ever <laughs> that I was ever quoting or you know I, I've, I've only sort of ever worked on things that I was really coming up with on my own I was scared by the Sunny Elizabeth relationship so much but I, I will also say and it's this seems like it's like easy to say in retrospect but like I had a I had a lot of fun I mean, fun is the wrong word. Uh, I had, I, I was, I, I found, I found the writing of this show like so exciting because I, it really did sort of challenge like every part of me. Like I really had to like go deep emotionally with myself, you know, process a lot of stuff that had happened to me in the past and also become like an armchair chemist and <laughs> like there was just so many things that I was like it was really I was really challenged by I think the Sunny Elizabeth relationship like if it felt so unknowable and I and it 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 it, it also was it felt dangerous to me because when when you don't know something as a writer and when you're up against it I think there's a tendency to fall into cliches or to like fall into stereotypes. Um, And so I was just like really aware of that and, and wanted to just make sure that it was never simple, you know, and those were just really hard scenes for me. I I was really scared of them becoming melodramatic. Sonny, 
fine. George doesn't like you, but I have to keep him happy, so get over Don't it. talk to me like you talk to other people. I, I'm not. What if I told everyone tonight? Tell them what? That you love me. That I am your king. I'll meet you at the party. I can't be late. That relationship was really one of those things where you show up at the rehearsal with the actors and you're kind of like, yeah, like I know what the scene is about. And you talk to them about what the scene is and you like hope that you actually do know what the scene is about. For those scenes with Sonny <laughs> and Elizabeth, I was constantly like, I think this is what it's about. And that was a place where Amanda and Naveen just really took the ball and ran with it. And I felt understood this relationship in in a very primal emotional way that I think I had gotten in my head overthinking things and they just sort of like went with it in this beautiful way that amazing actors do. Those scenes were really hard for me to write and I I think their performances gave the scenes and the characters like so much more depth than I did. <laughs> so sorry. You like to do the self-deprecating part after the fact. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I, I mean, look, you guys both know what a fan I am of all of it. So I think that goes without saying. But I, I just, every aspect of the work that both of you put into this has been for myself and the team, Taylor Dunn and Victoria Thompson, the podcast team, we have just been blown away by the care and the talent that you put in. And it just means so much to us the degree that you both, as well as everyone in the cast, and that extends so deep and layers and layers out of people working and caring. So I feel like a broken record sometimes saying it, but it is, it's it's the truth. I also will say, I think that came from your podcast. I mean, I felt like, and you and 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 how much care you guys put into the story and just thinking and you always say, I came to the table with questions. And I think like, that's exactly what you did. And Ultimately, I think that's what I hope the audience leaves with. Like, I never wanted to provide answers. I think I don't see that as my job, you know. So I think hopefully all the questions that we had were translated into a good story that just created more questions. So I, I think that that also really came from you. Thank you. And also, I think, you know, it's it's funny everybody comes to the table from different places and with different questions and the questions that you guys asked on the podcast, the journalistic integrity that, you know, the real curiosity, the human curiosity that you had sparked Liz's curiosity. And she came as, as a writer and a creator, like finding, finding out about Elizabeth from a different angle. And it's just like, you guys built this thing together. It was just like a domino effect and then by the time I get to the table, which is like at the end, I have all this information, you know, over the course of all of your research and all Liz's research and everything I have available. It's just like, how could it not be? I just basically set into a warm bath here, you know, <laughs> not just saying it wasn't hard, but I'm just saying like it, it it's rare and it's never going to happen again. <laughs> I'm like really sure that I'm not going to get to sit in on something and have something so cozy and, you know, and so thoughtful and so ready to be filmed. You know what I mean? It's just, it's rare. You guys are the reason, you know, this show existed and then, you know, it just snowballed from there. I, a warm, it was a warm bath that I drained a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> you filled it back up. You filled it back up. You put a bath bomb in it. Yeah, it was perfect. Sponsored by bath Lush. Bath. <laughs> <laughs> Multicolored bath bombs. No, I mean, I think I think about the anecdote. I mean, when the, like when I listen to the pod, it's so funny. Like doing this podcast, talking about the podcast. I'm oh, sorry, I just keep saying that. <laughs> but, uh, but like, I remember listening to the anecdote about her running on the track, yeah. you know, as an 11 year old. And, and that was in your last episode, I think. Everyone would finish the race. And then all of a sudden you'd hear the announcer say, don't cross the track. There's still a runner on the track. That runner was Elizabeth, but sure enough, she was not deterred by people laughing or, you know, um, people crossing the field. 
she was going to run that race and finish it, and she was determined to do it no matter what anybody said. I had been riveted the whole time, but it was like those anecdotes, you know, her sitting alone in her car dancing um, to to hip hop music, like what Ana Ariola, you know, told you, and just those little glimpses into into who she was as a person. Um, th that's what fired me up to write it. You know, I mean, I, I think like the story is from an intellectual level, like so interesting on like, and there's so many forces at work and big, like big other conversations that need to be had about a lot of other things, but just like the, the way that you guys had like drawn out her character in, in the story that you told in the podcast for me was like huge. And that, that anecdote about the track, I remember listening to it and just being like, well, that's the first scene. Hey, 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 and we'll cross the track till the last runner's done, all right? Why is she still running? Oh, Elizabeth, you're doing great. I mean, I think that's a, such a good question of like, why do you pick certain projects? And I, and I honestly don't know, but I, I I know that there's this like mix of fear and excitement and just like a thing that's gnawing at you where you're like, I can't get this out of my head. And that particular anecdote was just so vivid and so alive in my head. And I just remember that feeling of like, okay, well, this is a character I need to write, you know, like in listening to that. So yeah, it's, warm bath, warm bath. <laughs> I like the warm bath analogy, but I also think looking at it from the perspective of there were so many pieces of this puzzle that all had to come together, that all had to work from every person on the project being committed to it. COVID came up, a pandemic came up, everything got pushed, dates got moved around. Even that anecdote of Elizabeth's running on the track, that was something, it was in our last episode because this was someone who reached out after listening to the podcast. So you think about these, wow. these realities yeah. in life that the difference between yes and no, sometimes things either work out or they don't. Um, the deposition tapes, we knew they existed and we did everything in our power to get them. And we finally did. And we were the first ones to air them in the podcast. It could have gone the other way just as easily. But um, I wonder about the creation of this project as there was a court case, as the trial was going on. The trial got pushed many times because of the pandemic. And Liz, you had written you're in the process of shooting and then we get all of the text messages between Sonny and Elizabeth. Amanda, what was that like to read these text messages that on, in many ways were kind of validating this relationship that you were recreating? I, it's just such a bizarre, bizarre situation to be in because, you know, this is really happening, but we're on set making the imagined version in Hollywood and and there's a trial going on between the you know with this person with these people uh with all you know the witnesses and 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 the players in our show and I mean it's very easy actually to separate because we're this is there's no consequences for what we're doing um we're we're doing it because we love our jobs and we want to create and it's an incredible story and these people's lives are totally <laughs> like in jeopardy. Um, and so that feels very weird. There was a lot of guilt there for me at times. And then I'd tell myself to like just chill out because the truth is like she created this for herself. So, you know, she's she's no one's victim, of course. But, you know, it just still made me feel uncomfortable knowing that she's going to court every day while her baby is at home or with her. And she's being judged by the media every single day and every move she makes. And now her intimate text messages are being released. It's just like, it's really hard not to feel for her. And I think it helped in a lot of ways, you know, connect to, to that side of things. But I also feel like it was just so, it was just two bizarre times. You were so in it at that point, Amanda, you know, because we'd already shot two thirds of the show and you'd, 
created this amazing character that, as you said, was a mix of you and me in the writing and her, you know what I mean? So you'd, you'd kind of created your own version of her. This is an inspiring step forward, 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 forward. This is an inspiring step forward. Yeah, but also just like the moments of just, oof, what? Why did you say that? What are you talking about? No, please don't be. This can't be true. Like, please. I'm trying. I'm trying to do a good thing for us. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> just, it's a. Uh, it was icky. You can't play a character well and, unless you're you're fully, you know, rooting for that character and seeing things from that character's point of view. Exactly. But by by the end, honestly, like, come on, things were falling apart and it was really hard. I don't know about like how you felt when, you know, the, we were wrapping up in October, but when we were shooting all those choices, the wrong choices that she was yeah. making, I was slowly pulling back. I was slowly pulling apart and it made it even easier for me to play the darker sides of her because I don't have to agree with her but I at least have to understand why she's doing it and have, and have compassion for, for maybe why she would behave that way. But I don't, I don't have to agree with it. So it's like there was, I was peeling back layers, but I was also kind of separating a little bit from her. And those text messages helped me separate because they really nailed her in a lot of ways. I'm totally with you in that. Like I've said a lot that it's like, you know, I had never written drama before and I think that's not just about jokes. I think I'd never written a character that, you know, took such a turn, you know, that like, like exactly what you're saying, sort of like a character who starts to make the wrong choices, um, a character who starts to self destruct in that big of a way. Like I, I think with obviously with comedy, you're just never, you know, you fall in love with your character in comedy and then like you still love them at the end, you know, <laughs> and I think like with drama, it was very different for me. It was th those final episodes were very hard for me to write probably in the same way that they were hard for you to perform because it's, you know, at that point you've spent so much time with the character and you're, you know, you are not rooting. I mean, for me, I'm, I wasn't like, it was, it's more just like a connection and then you have to write them doing these things that are very questionable <laughs> it was it was just new it was a really new experience for me too I think I, I especially had a trouble with the fifth episode you know where she's where she decides to to go forward with the Walgreens launch and the episode where Ian Gibbons commits suicide as well you know like it was like the, that that episode was was difficult for me get your money from somewhere else you've done it before I don't need your advice on this Ian you don't understand the business. And you don't understand the science. You know, the trauma aspect, the, the things that she's been through were the things that I held on to as, as buoys to like be able to continue um, justifying in my own head why she's doing certain things. <laughs> um, of course, I don't have to, you know, I, I can sleep at night. But while I was shooting them, you know, you just, you, you, you want it to be, effective um the performance to be effective and you have to come you know commit and connect in a certain way so those were yeah it was it was definitely by the end just i was just tugging at anything i could to get through you know october 15th or whenever our last day was and for an actor i mean this role it was such a marathon and watching amanda do it we were shooting for months and like it you know it's not it's not a movie it's not two hours it's you know, it's like hours and hours and like so many episodes. And Amanda was living in this role for so long. Um, and I mean, I, I honestly could not believe, I could not believe that you were like still standing in October, let alone giving the performance, giving the performance that you were giving. And like, I feel like that, like those last couple of days, I think you were like, I need to, I need to get out of here. Like, I need to <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know Rebecca you visited said and I mean you said it was surreal for you to just like walk into the set that was pretty much like a replica of the Theranos building I mean it, you know it's just uh, like life imitates art a little bit 
<laughs> art imitates life. I don't even know, but like, you know, we're all just sort of locked into this Theranos set, you know, and, and I was desperately trying to not like constantly compare the process of making the show to Theranos and like the process <laughs> of making of making the box you know so I, I don't know it was all like by the end I think we were all just like um we were all just really really in it um <laughs> I don't know but I actually think I mean it's it's interesting earlier what you said Rebecca about commitment I mean I think that's in some ways that's also what the story is about I mean what it takes to make something right I mean the choices that you need to make in some ways the way that you have to kind of give your whole life over to something um in order to make it work and then you know what happens that every choice builds on doesn't itself work. yeah and then you know i did find a lot of connections to what <laughs> what happened at theranos and and sort of the process of making something of making um you know a series yeah it's yeah, but our series. Well, I was gonna say our series ended up working. So I feel like honestly, this is a giant, giant success. It's a giant win because we we shot it, we finished it, we edited it, we put it out. People watched it, and we still get to talk about it. It exists, and and it it tests blood. No. <laughs> On this point of comic relief, I want to talk to you about what it was like on set because Liz said that it's very different to create a film than it is to create a show. How different? What's that like? What was it like on set? I know we met your dog, Finn, when we were on set, which was so fun. It was so much fun. Um, So we would have these little bubbles of cast members coming in for like a couple weeks and then leaving. And we had we shot this whole show in three blocks, the first four episodes in the first block, the second, the fifth and sixth in the second, and the seventh and eighth in the third. And we had the best cast I've ever seen in anything ever, I think. Um, we had eight hours of TV and so many people coming, like incredible actors coming in to like play in three days. And so we would cluster up and then we'd have these little bubbles of like time with each other between setups and between shots and between scenes and like everybody kind of got to know each other in a way and then they would leave and I'd be sad and then a new crop of characters would come in and actors would come in to play these characters like I got really tight with Utkarsh on the first um block and uh <laughs> uh Bill Irwin at like James Lau like we and the most incredible Kate Comer played my assistant, like hilarious. Like we were just texting with each other like 10 minutes or before this podcast. Like I've stayed in touch with all these people. And then, you know, the second crop, like Beth Marvel, um, Michael Gill, who played my parents came in and just like, like stole my heart. And now I'm just, uh, you know, I, and I'm also, I'm in awe of them as actors, um, Josh Pice, all the Walgreens guys, like insane. Like I'm telling you the most insane experience because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very social on set. I really don't go back to my trailer much. Um, I'm very curious about people. I'm, I'm pretty energetic. Um, I love my job because I need to survive because I'm away from my kids. So I might as well have as much fun as I can. So we created this little land called Table and we would bring the huge, huge collection of Copic markers, which are very, very good artist watercolor markers and paper. And then at one point when we were at the Walgreens place, Alan Ruck taught me how to draw. Um, everybody would start drawing, like, you know, just um, whoever was around table, which was usually everyone who's a, whoever's working at, at, at the time, uh, we would just draw. And it's just like everybody just got around so well do you still have any of the pictures you drew with alan ruck um yeah so uh i i he didn't like yeah he um basically was like you got to get this book basically what you do is you take a picture and then you put it upside down now see that and you showed me the lines so i have some pictures because i really like drawing houses i have some pictures of houses that i have on my phone still that i can't believe that i actually drew because he's like, yeah, you just draw it up. So here's the book you get. And I got the book and like, you know, I brought it back to set that next week. And 
It's not just that. It's like the stories these people tell. Stephen Fry is the nicest man to ever walk the planet. He also knows the most about everything you will ever know, and he's not a dick about it. Um, I can't, I can't. I mean, I could go for days about these people. These people. Are you kidding? I just saw Michaela a couple months ago. She came up to the farm. It's just. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I think if you're working on something so intense, like you have to find a way to just leave mentally, you know, I mean, I think, yeah. and I, I, yeah. you know, you had, you had your dog there. You had, you know, it's just like, I, I totally got it. I, 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 I remember at first I was like, wow, there's a huge dog on set. And then I was like, all the time. Of course, like of course, you know, like you need to play this part. Like you need that. Um, you need yeah. these kind of, like like s- s- buffers around you. You know, yeah, we did, and we we created a home, um, and it was a really cozy home. And then when people come in and they feel like they feel part of it, they feel accepted, and and like they, it just feels like a team effort in that way. And it just was like. I think it's one of the reasons the show works too, is that like everybody knew was very professional and very happy to be there. Like that, you know, we, and the makeup trailer, like everything, they take so much to make something right. Filming is hard. It's a lot more hours. It's not a nine to five. We are definitely, you know, we're doing something very specific for a lot of hours crammed in small places sometimes and it can be uncomfortable but you've got to like survive you got to make it fun and and we we do and we did on this show and that doesn't always happen are there any more stories any any more anecdotes that you've never shared anywhere else that you want to do here um i we have them so the entire crew shared a photo album and we would just add photos whoever took a photo, they would just add it to the photo album. So the whole crew would get it. And, um, someone took a picture of me. I think it was Kendra standing under this really weird spotlight, um, outside of chats at the studio. And the picture turned out so terrifying that Michael Showalter's assistant, Mika, who of course I'm still friends with too, made like photoshopped me as, um, many people, but one of them is Beetlejuice. And it was just, it, it, I had never, I hadn't, that's, I haven't laughed that hard in years for whatever reason, the picture of me went viral around the crew as soon as I put it on and everybody, like, I couldn't, I cry laughing so hard. I was like, this is, I don't know why. Maybe I was tired. Oh it's the ugliest, creepiest photo. And it's just me. It's, I didn't do anything to my face. It's the lighting, but I look like, <laughs> I look like Beetlejuice. It's so weird. And I I don't know what I think a ghost took over me or something. <laughs> it's really funny. It's, and I just said it as you. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. It's it's really it's really unsettling. It's really <laughs> unsettling. <laughs> but for some reason we weren't even shooting outside and here we here we were. Um I was like, I got get get a picture of me under there. And that's what happened. I want to see your full camera roll, given the glimpses that we've, <laughs> we've achieved. Like, it's one of those pictures that you look at, when you look at closer, it gets scarier. <laughs> yeah. You get it far away. It's like, <laughs> oh, it's and then you're like, Dang it. yeah. It's pretty fun. Listen, I had, I don't know if I'll ever have that much fun again. So I might as well just, um, I'm capitalizing on this moment. Like we got all these Emmy nominations, which is like more than you could ever have expected from anything, you know, like to get recognition and acknowledgement for some or a job well done, that kind of stuff. It's like, you don't expect that kind of stuff. It's happening. I get to keep talking about it. I get to keep hanging out with you guys. And I don't know. It's just like not going to happen again. <laughs> I like the way you think, Amanda. I think it's the way I think. Yeah. I, like we're like both just like it's like so negative in a in a good way. In a good so way. negative. So shocked. Always shocked when something good happens. Yeah, it's constantly yes. shocked. No, we um we like made like a Chatsworth <laughs> Gazette because we were in Chatsworth all the time, and we're like, you know, this place is this place is crawling with in- interesting things. Um, you know, what didn't we do in the show? It's just like the things people do when they're bored or. They've been around each other for too long without sleep. It's 
a lot of funny stuff happens. I mean, I used to f- with Michael Showalter just constantly. I made a whole video. I would like just f- with him because, because of course, because why not? Um, I like made him a hair piece out of my dog's fur when I just was grooming him. It's just <laughs> this is the stuff I did. And then he like threw it away because he thought it was disgusting. And I said, wow, I put a lot of work into this. Um, also there was a, I mean, I did get, I did get a Theranos tote bag that said fake it till you make it. And I do still, <laughs> you still use it. I use it. And then I was like, this is, we-, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, I can't carry this around. Like people, <laughs> I was just like, but you know what? You can give it to me. I don't, I don't have one. I don't know why I don't have one. <laughs> Oh my god, I have a three minute video of Michael Showalter just dancing around the camera because he was directing us to to do dancing because we did a lot of dancing um, to pop in bottles. And Liz, thanks for that song. And um, oh, that he, got cut. That got cut. I'm so sorry. But Michael Showalter is just for three minutes just dancing behind the camera as if it mattered. As if people were like, he was just making sure that we were getting it right. You know, when certain directors just act <laughs> as a monitor, this is what he was doing. Uh, Liz, any other scenes that got cut that you would have loved to keep? Well, that one was like, I really like everybody the whole way was like, this scene is going to get cut. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> but it was a scene. Um, it was another dancing scene. Um, in a series that had a lot of dancing scenes, but it was um, after or she gets invited to like you know meet Larry Allison, she goes home to Sunny and they dance around, kind of celebrating. And um, was it to pop in bottles? It was written in the yeah. I oh I I don't know if it ended up being pop in yeah. bottles, but I I know he actually says pop in bottles. Yeah. Which like is sunny, definitely sunny wrote. talking about popping bottles, and then they were like dancing around. Yeah, it was it was incredible, but ultimately <laughs> did not did not need to be in maybe for the story. There was definitely a couple. There was a few like comedy scenes that I felt like I wrote, and that in t- that I never knew like tonally if it was going to be kind of too silly. Like there was a scene where when they're about to show the prototype, Elizabeth's assistant kind of the, co- the coffee maker isn't working and she runs into the lab and she says, is the coffee maker's not working? Is anybody here an engineer? And like everybody raises their hand. <laughs> and then there was like, <laughs> there was like another scene after it where like all these engineers, including Edmund um, were trying to fix the coffee maker, but like talking really technically about coffee makers um, and it was too silly and we cut it. But the 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 on the plus side, I like had to do a lot of research on like how coffee makers work to write the lines. So I like now <laughs> I understand. Now you're making amazing coffee for yourself. Yeah. Uh, before we go, I want to hear from both of you if you have a favorite moment either from the actual series or from creating the series. Either one of you can go first. If one, if it's something just pops in your head, tell me. The masked dance, like the dance where yes, they're both like they're both wearing masks of Elizabeth's face um, after the uh, after the birthday party. I I just it's yeah, it it just kind of hits every every button I have. <laughs> like, oh my god! It, 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 it hit buttons I didn't know I had. I think. <laughs> It felt so good. The best experience I had was actually redoing this uh, scenes, um, shooting the scenes where we were um, actually using like footage when I was in, like during the deposition, it just, there was nothing more <laughs> invigorating than like repeating things that I'd, I'd learned, I'd heard over and over again out of someone else's mouth in their mm-hmm. same with their with this just the mannerisms and everything i just um i also just loved walking as her 
uh, there's too many things. I don't even know. Uh, I don't even know. I don't know. I mean, the obviously the dragon puppet thing is I keep the dragon puppet in the box of markers and I don't know. It's just, it was you all. Still have, just, you still have the dragon puppet. That's good to know. Oh, I sure do. I sure do. <laughs> I sure do. It's just, I mean, all it, 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 there's just, there's too much. There's too, there was so much fun had, um, and I really enjoyed every single, almost every single second, except when I got hit in the head with a camera, which was so bizarre. So not expected. Like the, the funny thing, like the funny things that happen at work. <laughs> um, yeah. God, what a dream. Dream come true. To both of you, Thank you. Congratulations. You have done such a tremendous job with this project. I'm in awe. So many people are in awe of what you have created here. Um, And this is also just a really fun conversation. So thank you for taking the time and good luck at the Emmys. We're all cheering you on. Thanks. Well, we'll see. We'll all be together. Yay. Yes. Thank you. Good. Thanks, guys. Nice to hear your voice. This bonus episode of The Dropout was written and produced by Victoria Thompson, Taylor Dunn, and me. It's edited by Brenda Salinas Baker. Special thanks to Sherry Rosenblum, Catherine Pope, Will Kim, Lisa Dong, Hank Sanders, and Josh Cohan. 